All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Dapper, Lego for Microservices. I'm Karen Chu, Community Manager at Microsoft and CNCF Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar, and we'd like to welcome our presenter today, Mark Charmy, Principal uh, Program Manager at Microsoft. And before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop in your questions there and we'll get through as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the, subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Basically, just please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recordings and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I will hand it over to Mark to kick off today's presentation. Thank you, Karen. Hopefully everybody can see the screen. Um, so in today's session, we're gonna do a kind of quick overview of the project drivers, what kind of um, drove us to create Dapper review the key capabilities that Dapper has. Uh, we're gonna do a short demo on a service composition using Dapper in a kind of event processing application. We're gonna cover the project status and roadmap on the end, and hopefully there's gonna be about 10, 15 minutes on the end to do a Q&A. So let's get going. Uh, so before I wanna go into the actual over Dapper, I wanna overview some of the kind of things that drove us to create uh, Dapper and what it's trying to solve. Um, I think there's many different uh, uh, reasons for that, but I think they boil down to three things. I think um, too often developers nowadays, st uh, their step one in writing any new application, they have to decide where this, where this application is going to run because moving that application later to a different platform will often require a complete rewrite. Uh, the other thing is that uh, these total or complete platforms uh, do help uh, and they kind of solve holistically a lot of different problems, but because um, uh, you have to kind of buy in 100% into, into uh, using them, they tend to kind of evolve slower and over time uh, kind of drift away from what's considered to be a modern architecture. And as a result, in a third point, um, the, in the average company today, I, I've spent over the last year probably talking to, I don't know, 30, 40 different companies out there and developers in those companies. The, um, the average developer, the gap between what the uh, existing application looks like and what it's considered to be a modern application in the community is increasingly larger and larger. And, and it's not common to find companies that have, I don't know, 1,500 to 2,000 applications that they want to modernize, but they want to do it all in one uh, swoop move. So these are kind of the things that uh, set up the context for Dapper and the type of things that we would like to solve for, uh, for the developers. So let's go into Dapper. Um, first of all, uh, just a short overview. Dapper stands for Distributed Application Runtime. Yes, we've abbreviated three words into four letters. Um, I know it was hard, but we've done it. Uh, in a plain English, Dapper is really an event-driven application. It's portable runtime that helps developers build distributed applications regardless when they run them, if, whether it's a bare metal, cloud, uh, edge devices, and I mean actually edge devices like Raspberry Pi or something. Uh, the, the runtime is kind of independent of that. It's an open source project. It's uh, hosted on GitHub under MIT license. And it has a very open governance. We just recently tweeted, uh, recently wrote about it, about our transition to open governance and the commitment to vendor neutral foundation uh, for Dapper. Throughout the presentation, you're going to see some QR codes they have posted in here that will have uh, direct links to places where you can actually learn more about the thing that I'm talking at that given time. In this case, it's a link to our blog post that we just uh, that I just mentioned. So that's kind of uh, what, you, what those QR score stands for there. All right, a little overview of kind of where we are with Dapper today. Uh, less than a year, it was October 2019 when we announced Dapper. So we've had 11 releases as of this AM, I'm happy to say. And I think we've landed uh, the 11th uh, release of Dapper or 11 major release, so V011. Uh, there's a decent number of image pools that actually signals a real life usage. So this is not just the kind of things that it's out there and sitting, but people using this in real life. We have 70 plus different components that cover pretty much the entire CNCF data and messaging spectrum of, of the map that you often see. Uh, and more about those components in a minute. And uh, there's a growing number of also contributors which validates the sense of broad community and helps us kind of um, drive uh, the direction of the project 
uh, as a consensus of the overall, overall community. And of course, the all important stars that uh, we all know are the critical to any open source project. I'm being sarcastic here. So what are some of the kind of uh, principles that, that are behind Dapper? So first of all, uh, is no limitations with regards to the language or framework. If, if, uh, if a new language come out, comes up tomorrow, um, something like, you know, I don't know, I can't even venture to think of what that would be. It, we should be able to run it. If, if you can start it if, as a process, we should be able to run it inside of Dapper. The other thing is that there is maximum emphasis around re reuse and of those building blocks as we refer to them. And again, more about those two, but those are a la carte opt-in mechanisms that you can use to kind of uh, uh, bring in certain capabilities that are common in modern distributed applications. Those, uh, when those building blocks are, uh, uh, when the available building blocks don't meet your needs or uh, where you wanna expand the functionality of that building block, Dapper provides a facility for you to kind of ex add an additional capability or expand or change the implementation, uh, which is very important if you wanna be able to kind of allow people to uh, scale and grow their application with their demand. Um, at the core of Dapper is also this well-documented set of APIs that, are, that provide a parity across multiple protocols and runtimes. So gRPC or HTTP protocol doesn't matter that the, the shape of the API, the functionality is, is the same, even though the protocols are different. And it runs, like I said before, it runs great on Kubernetes as well as any other um, uh, infrastructure where it can be like a standalone process. Uh, we've done this on bare metals. We've done it on Raspberry Pis, like I was talking about. Um, data center, customer's data center, wherever you can get Kubernetes, for example, it, it will do. And it's also supporting multiple architectures. So Intel, ARM, um, Mac, Linux, and Windows, um, you can uh, get either the um, readily available version of Dapper or just compile for those two. And, and, and the last thing is the Dapper really tries to meet the developers where they are. The investment that you've done in learning a particular language, Java, .NET, Python, whatever that may be, we wanna make sure that you feel at home in, in kind of natural, idiomatic is just a fancy term for natural to you, um, that should make you effective on day one. Um, there is no courses required, there is no certification. Use it uh, incrementally, start small, and then build from there. So hopefully that will give you a good background where uh, Dapper was going. Kind of logically, uh, and we'll go deeper into each one of those, but logically Dapper uh, at runtime kind of exposes those APIs, like I was saying, HTTP and gRPC. These APIs give you access to the most common uh, usage patterns that are, we've seen in distributed applications. And we generalize them into something that can be um, consistent to you as a developer, but yet flexible underneath so you can plug specific implementation of that. And we'll talk about those in a second too. And we refer to those as building blocks and you will hear me saying building block, building block throughout the presentation. And uh, uh, when combined, they provide like an open programming model that you can uh, start today with very smallly and then you move from environments, change your mind and, and apply these config uh, through configuration without rebuilding your application. So hopefully never again we hear about somebody uh, needing to move 1500 application in one swoop move to a new platform. So more on those building blocks, going deeper into there. Um, uh, these blocks are, uh, they're independent. So they're not in, there's no dependency between each one of those blocks. So we, let's go through those one by one. Service to service invocation, or uh, it's, uh, it's a basically a reverse proxy-like API for communication between multiple services within your application. So if you're building microservices, you're building n number of different services inside of a, uh, something that's considered to be an application. And for you to be able to dynamically discover those services and connect to them, that's where, where Dapper comes in. The other common thing that we see pretty much is, is state management. Uh, think about durable key values, object store, like S3 or GCS, uh, that gives you this put, uh, get, uh, uh, verbs capabilities that allows you to kind of query by, by state. The shape of those APIs is pretty consistent. Yeah, they have different functional capabilities, but to a large degree, we can kind of give you a very consistent API to that, uh, to managing your state in your application. With regards to Paps app, this is all about messaging within the application. There is, um, you know, um, different perspective on what mark, mark, 
microservices should be doing. They should be service in, to service invocation directly, or they should be in synchronous through PopSub. Dapper provides you both of those. So if you're looking for a messaging between your application, a synchronous messaging between applications, you can use PopSub that's built in and you can plot the specific implementation underneath of that. So if you, if you wanna do like a fan out uh, pattern or a fan in, uh, uh, super easy to do that. And there is a uh, exact, uh, at least once uh, delivery semantics. So you don't have to worry about kind of events being lost. Uh, resource binding is kind of one of those bindings that one of those uh, uh, building blocks that allows us to extend the functionality of Dapper consistently. So there, uh, think of those as a connector to the uh, to uh, to the outside world, to other resources that are not inside of your runtime. You can trigger your code based on external events when they tr when they run when they kind of happen outside of your cluster or outside of your environment, and you can send data from your application to outside resources. Actors, uh, and I will go through each one of those a little deeper, but uh, trying to provide a little summary here. Actors pr uh, very much like an independent unit of distributed state and single threaded compute capability. So if you're thinking of something that is gonna require high density, that's a great uh, great kind of category for that. There are some concerns you have to be aware of uh, around uh, single thread threading, uh, threading architecture, but we'll talk about it in a second. And observability, it very much all about automatic uh, kind of insight into what your application is doing. So capturing the call graph of uh, of all the invocation across graph, across Dapper, and the telemetry with regards to those metrics that uh, are uh, related to how your applications are responding, how many times, how long did it take, and, and tracing of the uh, invocations across multiple services. If you're talking about microservices, you probably have a call stack that involves four, five, ten, even more microservices and being able to look at them uh, as a unit helps you kind of debug those issues and understand the bottlenecks. And we have uh, secrets we've all heard about, uh, you know, these leaking all the time. What Dapper is trying to do is give you very much opaque get API to the secret management that could be backed up by a very robust set of uh, secret management uh, solutions. So HashiCorp, Vault, uh, Google KMS and many other ones. And each one of those building blocks has n number of implementations underneath them, which means that uh, you can choose the kind of optimal use case per service or per application um, uh, of what you want to use to be implementing these, build, these building blocks. So let's kind of talk about the architecture. So uh, uh, regardless if you run on Kubernetes bare metal VM, Dapper uses this notion of a sidecar and yes, I know it's okay. Uh, sidecar is kind of correlated often with uh, Kubernetes, uh, but in this uh, case, Dapper uses this sidecar approach regardless where you're running. Um, the the app call uh, the app calls into Dapper sidecar, uh, and Dapper kind of execute uh, the, the functionality on behalf of your application. This ho helps lower the utilization or and offload I/O often. In some cases, can actually improve the performance of your application. All services invocations are encrypted over MTLS with automatic uh, certificate rotation, including situations where you up upgrading the actual Dapper itself. Uh, and uh, with this release that we announced earlier today, we also have added a, a spiffy uh, identity for service invocation and granular access controls, including OPA policies if you, if you like Regal. Uh, yes, there's overlap with many mesh uh, meshes out there, uh, as you probably have already realized. If you are, uh, if you really, really are uh, committed to using Istio or Linkerd, you, you can just disable the MTLS and use Dapper in, in kind of conjunction with those with those meshes. So, how do I get one of those magical sidecars that does everything regardless where I run? Well. Uh, if you're running on Kubernetes, that's as simple as decorating a deployment with a few annotations. And I bought uh, that text over here. Uh, there's many of those annotations you can add, but really only two are required. You say enable uh, Dapper, and then you also tell me uh, tell Dapper what is the ID by which you want this application to be used, which comes into service invocation and many other things. Uh, Dapper will automatically inject um, a, a sidecar into the pod, so it will look very much like that experience that you had when you were developing using Dapper on a local machine. It will, in fact, your application will know anything different. Uh, in a standalone mode, if you're running outside of Kubernetes or you're running on any other infrastructure, you can run it uh, using the Dapper run command. Uh, in a self-hosted mode, as we refer to it, uses Dapper run, and regardless of what the process is, I've demonstrated 304 in here, it could be uh, a directly into a runtime, so Go or Node or .NET or whatever that might be, 
or it could be actually an executable that's already uh, kind of compiled into machine code or something like that. So a lot of flexibility there. With regards to kind of Dapper and Kubernetes, I think this is a good one to go a little deeper given CNCF and Kubernetes. Uh, we try to keep Dapper as light as possible. So there's really only two CRDs. Uh, there's four system pods, although we can we can bring them down to about two if if you're some of, uh, not using some of the features. So uh, first one is the sidecar injector. This is what checks for the annotations and inject the sidecar into your pod. Sentry generates certificates uh, uh, for the sidecar implements rotation strategy. The operator tracks deployments and deals with re uh, things like uh, resource discovery and component registry. And actor placement uh, deals with um, identifying or finding where the dappers are located, uh, the actors are located, and then uh, kind of providing metadata around us. More about actors in a minute, uh, because they can be rehydrated or all over the place depending on uh, where dapper is so optimal deployments for those. There's also health APIs and live probes that you would normally see in any kind of Kubernetes deployment. So let's go into those building blocks a little deeper and kind of show them in a real world like examples. Uh, so starting with the key value state management, uh, it is distributed object store uh, for your applications. What that means is that it outlives the session of the application. If your application goes out of scope, it can be re uh, restarted somewhere else and it will have access to the same um, content, so the same state. It, it has a, um, uh, uh, concurrency configuration options per each operation. So you can do a first or last wins if you're lo looking around, uh, have concerns around con uh, concurrency. It has similar configuration for consistency with regards to whether it's a strong or optimistic uh, uh, co consistency. And it's configurable retry policy, which means it's super granular. It's not only on the entire service, but it's an operation. It can be uh, invoked per uh, retry per operation. It's configurable. We also support bulk and transactional operations for situations where you want to uh, uh, save n number of records, uh, or if you are uh, trying to retrieve n, num uh, n number of records. Uh, the back state for those is totally to you, up to you. There, there's Dapper supports, I think, check this morning, about 12 of those. So etcd, Redis, Cassandra, GCP, Cloud, Firestore, AWS, Dynamo, there's n number of those uh, configurations. And depending on what you prefer in your environment, you might use those, but the API, which will be exposed to you to use the state in your application is consistent. So how do you configure that? Uh, for, uh, you will see this throughout, so uh, some um, kind of uh, high, highlights here. We're using this notion of a components. Components uh, are n representations of n number uh, of components can be kind of implementing a particular building block. In this case, we see uh, it's a component, uh, I call this corporate DB, but it could be frankly anything. It's a component of a type of state, and in this case, it's a MongoDB. So Dapper provides these configuration options for any number of those um, components that we've highlighted before, 70 or some before. What it gives you access to is uh, some metadata that you can use to configure the actual service itself, um, including like uh, you know the database and other things. But once configured, one register in Dapper, now is becoming available in your, um, in your Dapper API. So you can post to it uh, by identifying the specific um, uh, component and uh, save the data to its particular collection, in, in this case, uh, to Mongo database. The metadata is unique to a specific store. So in this case, this Mongo might have metadata that's specific to Mongo. If you were using etcd, there might be additional parameters there. And you will see the other options we provided. Uh, moving on to uh, service discovery and invocation. So Dapper, uh, like I said, is a reverse proxy for your invocation but, uh, that allows you to kind of locate the services and invoke them uh, using the assign ID. So in the previous example we used, uh, I don't know, I forgot what we used, but if you say, for example, my service is the ID of your application, you can start invoking from all your other services uh, within your application and, and Dapper will make sure you find the right, right instance. The, uh, all of that is dynamic. There is no configuration for this one because the, the, as you kind of start the services within Dapper, they all automatically are registered and the registry is managed for you. Uh, it works in Kubernetes. It works even across namespaces. So you can cross the boundary of the namespaces and uh, you can invoke them over HTTP or gRPC. So regardless what your application is running on, in this case, example, we have a HTTP application that it's calling into the gRPC application. The API is consistent for that application. Dapper does the protocol translation. So gRPC to HTTP or HTTP to gRPC, all of that is done behind the scene. Your applications don't have to be aware of what the target is uh, using. 
uh, all, like I said before, invocations are automatically retried on a, on a call level, which is more granular with, more, which, with what you get normally from the meshes. Uh, all traffic between apps is over MTLS. The automatic, it's automatic, so there is zero downtime even during the third uh, rotation process and, um, and upgrades. And because now Dapper also support, uh, provides the X509 certificates, we can do sp uh, sp spiffy identity across clusters uh, for service invocations. So if you, for example, have one instance of Dapper running on GCP and another one on AWS, you can reliably and securely kind of connect them and invoke each other. Dapper also have uh, options for policy uh, through annotations, uh, which kind of obfuscates a lot of the complexity, as well as for proper upper uh, OPA implementation for Rego. So if you prefer writing applications in Rego, uh, sorry, policies in Rego, you can, you can do that. Uh, all of that comes with automatic telemetry. You don't have to create spans uh, as, uh, because Dapper has the awareness of how your applications are invoking each other. That, that parent um, uh, trace ID is automatically injected and you can start kind of seeing the benefits. I'm gonna show you this during the demo uh, later on. Uh, another pop building, popular building block is pops up. It, it really allows microservices to communicate with each other. So publishes, uh, uh, the publisher has no knowledge of what the consumer is and the consumer has no idea who, who published the data. Uh, and Dapper uses CNCF cloud events to as a kind of envelope for those. So wraps all those events for you. It provides kind of at least once consistent, uh, sorry, provides at least once um, guarantees for your, uh, for your publishers. Uh, so some of the common implementations for uh, pops up inside of Dapper uh, for open source would be like Redis, Nats, Kafka, RabbitMQ, Hazelcast. Uh, there's probably a missing bunch of other ones. And for cl uh, cloud search providers, for Azure it's like a service bus or event hub. For GCP is pops up, and for AWS is SQS. And there's a couple other ones for each one of those. But whichever you want to use, uh, Dapper provides you ability to scope those so your applications can be limited to which. Uh, topics, for example, which applications can use each one of these components. Again, um, very much like we've seen before with a state, exactly same component, but this time instead of state, we say pops up. In this case, I'm using Redis. Uh, this is inside of the cluster, so we're calling into a Redis namespace, fully qualified name. And we. Uh, the other thing you're going to see here, I'm going to talk a little more about secrets, but you actually see that it didn't include the password for Redis. A reference a password and we'll talk about how Dapper kind of allows you to do it both programmatically and inside of configuration. But once, once registering inside of Dapper, you get ability to um, share uh, post to these topics and consumers can kind of uh, subscribe to them. There's two different ways to um, subscribe to uh, create subscriptions inside of Dapper. You can do this programmatically where Dapper queries your app for well-known endpoint and uh, of, for subscription. And this is kind of good for dynamic use cases where you want to kind of respond with a specific uh, configuration. And the app responds with a array of number of different subscriptions where you tell us uh, to which component and topic you want to subscribe and what is the URL you want us to send, uh, you want Dapper to send the data to. Um, that's great if you have awareness of Dapper when you are writing this application. For situations where you already have applications that are aware of cloud events or are expecting cloud events, you can use declarative manner, which Dapper provides a CRD for, that allows you to subscribe to, uh, to uh, create subscriptions uh, program, uh, through configuration. So your application actually has zero awareness of Dapper. It just says, I, I, I know cloud events, give me cloud events, and Dapper will send those uh, to, the, to your application. Um, uh, bindings, like I said, it's uh, kind of a way to extend the functionality of, of Dapper, uh, and, and there's so many of these out there. I'm just going to list a few, and I feel like uh, I'm highlighting a couple of these consistently, but I'm trying to create some var variety. We have two different flavors of binding. There's input and output bindings, and the output bindings can be bidirectional, and I'll explain what that means. For input, you can, uh, you can think of those as triggers. So something will come from outside and trigger your code and bring some data or maybe not. Uh, and uh, so Kafka uh, and all the data kind of uh, eventing uh, systems out there are, all, uh, are good uh, use of kind of uh, binding, but we can also have APIs like Twilio or Twitter and so forth. It really removes a lot of the complexity of your application having have to have the drivers or, or SDKs inside of your code and polling for that. It basically, the application says, I don't, I don't know how this was configured, but give me your, you, th that event and I will do something with that. It, 
Your application can be in gRPC or HTTP. It doesn't matter that event can be bound to you. And switching between these bindings at runtime is really as easy as changing configuration and, and in some cases relaunching the application. So Dapper hand, handles a lot of the retries and, and failure recovery for you. And again, none of that you have to write in your application. It kind of keeps your code very lean and allows you to change your mind post-deployment. Similarly, in the output binding, it allows you to kind of invoke from your code to the outside world. Uh, just like with the other ones, we have a number of these out there for different systems and services. Um, in fact, I just saw um, a couple of days ago, somebody just uh, PR'd a, a iOS notification binding. So you can send events directly into your, into your phone if you're using iOS. Um, just like with input binding, your, your code is free of SDKs. Um, uh, you can switch easily switch between bindings at runtime through configuration and all the retries are handled for you. So regardless uh, if you're using input and bound put, uh, output binding um, uh, approach, the configuration of that using component is exactly the same. And at this point, you've seen me show three different YAMLs that really differ very differently, very little. They only have some metadata that's specific to, in this case, for example, Kafka, uh, that, that differs and provides you ability to configure. Uh, but the actual uh, notion of configuring your bindings inside of Dapper is super consistent and easy, regardless if you're running in Kubernetes or if you're running on-prem, that same file will work. So in this case, uh, we have a Kafka binding that um, defines a specific topic. It could be n number of those for simplicity of demo, just have one um, to which it's going to be used to on, on the input. And for output, we also have limit which topic can be used to send data out of the application. We support consumer group. There's a number of other variables that Kafka provides, uh, but that, that kind of is the extent of that. And then for input, your application would, um, in this case, the name of the component is my Kafka. Uh, your application, the route in your application would just have to expect to have a, there should be a route in your application called my Kafka. And Dapper will post to, the, put, uh, to that. It will also check before um, uh, for options on that just to make sure that you actually have that route so it doesn't start flooding you with data before you are ready for that. And uh, for calling outside of your code into the outside world, you're just using the consistent binding API with that same component and, and Dapper maps all of that for you. We, talked, uh, we touched on secrets a little before, but um, secrets are generally hard problem. And we've all heard, heard about leaked credentials out there. Dapper provides you with this API that that is consistent regardless of which backend you use. So I have uh, logos for four of, five, four of those out there. There's other options too, um, but um, these uh, the systems are backing Dapper's API behind the scenes. So you can manage the rotation strategy and all that over there. And then Dapper gives you this consistent API that you can use both from um, within your code through the same API. So get, for example, my secret, it will return the secret. Um, but you can also use this inside of configuration, and I'll talk about this in a second. Um, so uh, in this case, we're using a HashiCorp uh, Vault uh, uh, secret store. We've configured this with uh, a few configuration options. There's a number of these. Again, I'm just showing a few. Uh, but you, you can uh, now invoke that API uh, in Dapper for secrets for specific password and you will get that value of that, but you can also use this inside of the configuration. So what Dapper will do in this case, it will substitute uh, these secrets, um, uh, kind of inline those secrets for you. So your configuration is free of secrets, you can check it into repository, and as you deploy it to different environments, your entire solution is configurable at runtime. And, uh, Observability is kind of a built-in building block. There, there's, there's some configuration for it, but what, there's a lot of automatic things that happen. And so I want to talk about a few of those. First of all, there's a ton of metrics that Dapper gives you kind of visibility into with regards to the, uh, the measure values and the counts uh, around time series, uh, monitors behavior of, of itself, of that sidecar, as well as of your application. And by default, it uses Prometheus and Grafana. There's a number of options to switch into CSP-specific uh, options like, uh, for example, monitor on Azure. Similarly, with distributed tracing, it, it uh, profiles and monitors Dapper system services and the application. Uh, it's important for microservices because really, if you don't have distributed tracing, you don't know how things kind of work together. Um, so it helps you identify um, uh, bottlenecks, helps you identify some issues and failures. And, and because this um, 
uh, it's kind of like a mesh-like ar architecture. It gives you these distributed traces automatically across the entire stack. So service invocation in, or, or bindings or, or um, state or any, whatever that may be, you get those traces automatically. And I'll show you later, but all of that is uh, by default av available in Zipkin. If you're deploying some kind of an open source centric solution in a CSP environment, you can use additional like application insights on Azure, for example. And, and similarly with logs, you get, you get Fluentd and Elastic and Kibana. Uh, you can substitute some of those things uh, and, sh and ship you logs uh, somewhere else. Uh, Dapper injects a bunch of metadata into your logs, so you get like uh, the type and the host name and component name and app ID addresses and a bunch of other things that give you kind of more context for actually what happened there. Right now, actors um, uh, as a building block, it's uh, like I said, it's an object-oriented programming model like Akka and Orleans uh, uh, provides durable framework for hosting your, your actors. Uh, Dapper basically what what its functionality here is. It's a self-contained unit of code that you deliver to Dapper that has both the state and compute and Dapper manages the life cycle of that actor. It's based for uh, use cases with minimal IO because it's single threaded. So if you start locking, it will basically lag the entire solution. But there is a lot of um, benefits people can recognize through super high density. I think the numbers I've seen is like thousands of um, actors within a single pod. And, and obviously this can scale horizontally. And Dapper manages the state of your actors, offloads them when they're not used. All of that is configurable. It, it can rehydrate them somewhere else with the right state. And, um, but because um, the actor model is kind of function of the runtime itself, Dapper supports actors only in Java, .NET, and Python. Everything, every other building blocks up to now, I told you about is 100% uh, across all the frameworks, uh, all of the different uh, languages. Um, so, at this point, you're saying, okay, this is great, but there is a lot of URLs and uh, gRPC endpoints. Have we not moved past that? Well, um, yes, we've done. We pro you can always use the raw API if you want to. And, and in some languages, there are dynamic. It's kind of like a first-class citizen. REST APIs, like in Node.js, is something that you're already used to. Uh, but we provide also a five SDKs that we manage, uh, the Dapper project manage, manages currently. There's a number of those. Uh, I know there is a Rust, there is C++, and a bunch of other ones that the community manages too. Um, so if one is missing that you would like to see, would love to have you kind of contribute and help uh, uh, working on that. And they give you this access to the same API. And when we go into demo in a minute, I'm gonna show you um, how we can leverage that to kind of simplify the application. There's also uh, integration into some of the frameworks. So for example, functions or Azure functions, you know, regardless if you're running on Azure AKS or um, another cluster, you have access to, uh, to those functions. And uh, if you're kind of into the model of just uh, programming only a fu at the function unit, uh, you can kind of integrate it very easily into Dapper and bind these configuration options uh, for different state and pops up uh, very easily. Similarly with Logic Apps, Spring Boot, ASP.NET Core, and others. All right, I think at this point, let's go into demo. So um, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna start with a, uh, actually no, let's uh, do a slide. Kind of walk you very quickly through the demo so we know where we are. Uh, we're going to do way over engineer application. There's probably way simpler way to doing, but to show kind of the capability, I will um, I will show the three or four different components inside of Dapper. So first of all, we're going to use the binding for Twitter to uh, create a subscription for a specific stream of um, tweets, uh, and we're going to com uh, combine that within the application and then persist each one of those tweets into a Mongo database. Then we're gonna add a sentiment analysis API as an, another Dapper service that's gonna be using service to service invocation to score each one of those tweets sentiment. So we're gonna find if they're negative, positive or neutral um, or mixed sometimes. And uh, when we score those, the, the tweet processor will also publish them onto a topic. And eventually we'll bring a UI application um, that will show those uh, tweets in a UI. Don't get excited, my UI foo is super weak, so it's gonna be a very rudimentary application, but it will allow you to kind of see how we can subscribe to events and stream them, in this case, over web sockets to the UI. All right, so let's now go to the application. So a couple of things I wanna show here, and, and obviously there's a lot of moving parts, but the first thing is uh, we're gonna show the component for Twitter. You see that even though I'm running on a local machine, 
I'm using secrets. And it's because in this case, I'm using a one of those developer friendly, quick and dirty kind of uh, secret stores, which is a file store. So in this case, my uh, secret store for Dapper is defined as a file that I'm hosting on my machine. You can use environment variables as well. And uh, on a local machine, it allows you to just kind of use those secrets. When later on, when we move to uh, something like Kubernetes, and I'll show you how to deploy that, you will actually use the secret, uh, uh, the Kubernetes secrets, because that's the kind of optimal use, way of using there. The other thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to define a state. In this case, I'm going to use uh, uh, Redis for state, uh, as well as for pops up, so that nothing changes there. Super easy for your local development, and we're going to run that. Um, these other the other thing to kind of point out here is uh, I'm actually using the Dapper SDK. This is for Go. It, the very same principle would apply for every single other language out there. I just can't write anything pretty much but Go, and even that is pretty weak. Uh, but you will see that um, them creating a service. The the part I want to focus on is the odd of creating a subscription to a or kind of binding handler is as simple as uh, on a, it's a method on the client. So you say, I want to subscribe to the tweets. Remember, we define tweets as the component name and uh, and then just handle. And the handler is super simple, doesn't do anything other than just publishing it to a, uh, to a topic that it's configured again through configuration. So this is as exciting as YAML can get. Let's go to um, go. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch um, locally uh, the viewer. You will see the Dapper went through its uh, login process in here, started the application. It told me uh, that HTTP API is on this port and the gRPC is on this port, which are uh, configurable. And it also kind of give you a nice checkbox here. You're good to go locally. Uh, and pretty much the same thing works for every single application. What we're going to do in here, we're going to actually start a gRPC application on a specific port. This is going to be the sentiment scoring application. And we're going to point to where the configurations are. Again, I'm just using Go itself directly. Um, similar, uh, I'm on a Mac, so Mac asked me to make sure that I allowed that to happen. Um, and uh, exactly same thing for the tweet processor. Um, uh, there's some old tweets in here. And we're going to start the tweet provider. And what's going to happen in here is uh, this is an HTTP one. You see the same thing. And I use the term football. And uh, for reasons that we are recording this tweet, I'm actually not going to open the UI because I'm embarrassed uh, what could be out there. Uh, but I'm going to open one for, um, for Dapper, uh, the, for term Dapper, that I'm actually already running on a server. And this is uh, deployed on Kubernetes. And I'm going to come back later, show you how I've done that. You will see a number of, of tweets. And if, you act, uh, if you're going to tweet, and please be uh, nice. Don't say something that will embarrass me. And uh, so uh, if you tweet something, it will automatically come in here. But what for each one of those, we can see, for example, that I was very excited about the uh, Spiffy support and Alpa. So I tweeted about it, and the, the tweet was identified as po positive. Joe Beta uh, actually saw that too and jumped on it. We see some people that maybe are less, uh, maybe they were retweeting. Um, so it's hard to tell if they were excited about it or not. But um, the sentiment is there. It's kind of not the function of the application. The one thing I want to show you is that. Uh, in the entire code, there was no uh, mention of any tracing, right? We, our code was very simplistic. But what we were able to do is within your application, it actually create the map of these. So for each one of the uh, services, we can drill down, identify what was happening. We can switch to logs. We can see metrics of the entire system, in this case, Dapper, and, and um, the performance characteristics of each one of those asset changes. Um, so it's it's uh, super um, transparent to the developer who just writes the logic of the application. They don't have to worry about the actual plan. Are we almost out of time? So I'm going to switch quickly to this. Uh, actually, let's see if somebody posted something. Okay, nobody did. All right. Oh, random. So let's um, let's go back. Uh, the entire demo is 100% reproducible and it walks you through each one of the steps. You can go to this uh, short link or just scan the, uh, the barcode, um, the QR code. Uh, it will walk you through the creation of the cluster and, and uh, if you don't have one, as well as configuring of the different components and deploying of the application. The, uh, let's talk about for integration uh, very quickly or, or skip that even. A uh, couple of things that the project is doing right now. We 
a stable set of APIs. Um, uh, with this new release, we've kind of uh, made uh, some changes in API. So at this point, the, the API is stable. We've delivered access control and service identity, like was already talking about. We've actually done a security audit with one of the CNCF uh, certified company and published those results as part of this PR too. So you can go to GitHub and find those, uh, the reports about the security audit that we have performed. Uh, we have also announced uh, a uh, project transition to an open source governance, uh, to a, a vendor neutral kind of way of looking at this project, making sure that this is sustainable over time. So uh, what's next? Uh, kind of by, uh, by the end of the year, uh, we're looking to release a release candidates of the 1.0. This is based on the feedback we've got from customers and the people or, or users using this in, in the real world. There's, uh, we wanna definitely start uh, focusing more on addressing the friction from the real world use cases. So as people kind of more and more are taking this to, a, uh, to production deployments, they feed us information and we kind of making sure that this is the highest priority to make sure that those deployments are successful. Um, there is a fair amount of infrastructure work going on behind a project. If you're gonna be sustainable as an open source project, um, you need to make sure that you have a good uh, per performance and, and performance automation. We have a lot of that too, but we wanna make sure that this is all uh, accessible to general community. They're gonna be working on, on Dapper. Uh, we're gonna start also seating the technical steering committee, uh, just uh, reaching out to the outside community and bringing, evaluating, kind of identifying who are the right people who should be on this. And then uh, very much kind of focusing on ensuring the readiness for production grade workloads, which means uh, paying a little more attention maybe to the operator and making sure that some of the metrics that the uh, traditional enterprise or large scale deployments operator would wanna see um, uh, as the focus has been definitely on the, on the developer so far. All right, in closing, uh, Dapper IO is a good starting point for pretty much anything on Dapper. Um, the project itself, like I said, is hosted on, on GitHub, so uh, github.com forward slash Dapper. There is a chat on Gitter as well as Twitter uh, kind of uh, monitoring going on, so looking forward to hear you. There's a few videos about Dapper uh, that I've kind of collected into a playlist that you can access. If you can't find anything else, if you need me, uh, any other information, um, I provided my email address, uh, which might not be the wisest thing in a recording video, but uh, looking forward to hear from you. Karen? Um, cool, awesome, thank you for that great presentation. We now have some time for questions. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, reminder to please drop it in the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen, and we will get through as many as we can. Um, so right now there are a few questions. Uh, first one is, is Dapper production ready? If not, any idea when it can reach production ready stages? We have a project starting this month and we we're thinking of using Dapper for it. Yeah, so like with any open source project, you're, you're, uh, you're kind of working on the zero dot, uh, dot to releases, right? And, um, and it's kind of assumed, I think, that that's probably not production grade. But what happens, customers actually deploy this in production. So we have a, a, a few customers that went with Dapper to production. Um, uh, I, I would say, depending on the use case, uh, if you're going to be running monitoring system for a nuclear power station, I would probably wait a little longer, but if you're looking for some kind of monitoring application uh, with ability to um, reprocess the data if we find something, uh, that's definitely ready for, for that. So um, uh, yeah, I think we're getting very close there. Uh, I think RC1 definitely is intended to be a production group. Awesome. Um, next question, it says, are you seeing a demand for streaming gRPC connections in addition to um, unary gRPC sessions? Yeah, no, we, we do get that question. Uh, we do see uh, people asking for uh, streaming uh, support. Um, I think we're trying to understand a little more the use case um, the, uh, rather than just technology and what that would look like in a generic API. Um, so if you're interested to kind of provide a, a kind of context for how this would help you in your use case, we would love to know that because that's kind of what Dapper drives its functionality by is what is the pattern and how can we kind of help developers in this case? Great, next question. What are the main differences between Dapper and Cloud State of Light Bend? Oh, so the, um, the Light Bend team has actually worked with Dapper team on the Cloud State and uh, Cloud State is one of the supporting uh, uh, components 
supported components for state inside of Dapper. Um, so uh, I would say in, with regards to state, it's one of the options inside of Dapper. Sorry, I should have mentioned that cloud state was there. Cool, next question. Are there any plans to support distributed transactions across multiple microservices? Ooh, I would love to know more about this. So um, the service invocation in a cluster uh, can give you some guarantees of transactions depending on what you do. But uh, I think bef I would wanna probably understand a little more what that looks like. If, if we're talk talking about like a secondary or tertiary in service invocation and having some guarantees around that, um, I th think uh, right now that's not, that's not supported or that's not an option. Uh, I think you can accomplish similar thing through pops up just by virtue of retries and uh, kind of using this until you reject a particular message. Uh, but uh, I would love to know more about it. Uh, if you if you have a uh, way to open an issue inside of uh, Dapper, love to hear about that context. Uh, he followed up with uh, such a saga pattern. Okay. Ooh, I have to admit I am not for saga pattern. We'll look it up though. Ping me on email or Twitter and I, I, I'd, I'd love to talk to you more. Um, okay, or uh, Stuart said maybe it's Sage <laughs> and that they said okay to ping you. Um, cool, uh, if anyone has any more questions, please drop them in. By the way, on this uh, transactional thing, there's uh, probably a few uh, uh, members from the Dapper community who are a lot more, more knowledgeable than I am on this area and I'm probably cringing right now saying, what is Mark saying? Uh, <laughs> please uh, post it in, in Gitter, um, us, uh, us the topic and would love to have a conversation on that. All right, last call, all right, last call for questions. All right, well, uh, let's go ahead and wrap that up. Uh, thank you, Mark, for a great presentation and Q and A. That is all the time we have. Um, that is all the time we have for questions today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. The webinar recording and slides will be online later today, and we are looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.